going to be looking at pretty much um, Mark chapter 12. Um, so if you want to turn in your Bibles. Uh, also, there, um, there's some pamphlets in the back, um, just if you want the tentative schedule and so forth. Um, and again, if you have any questions or anything, the guys that have the t-shirts on that look like this, ask them and they'll help you. If you need someone to pray with you, they'll either pray with you or find somebody who will. Um, so we're talking about the greatest commandment. So we want to learn and we want to realize how we're to love God. Um, give me a little background on Mark here. Um, in Mark, the word immediately occurs 36 times in the book of Mark. You've probably heard all this. Uh, it is thought that this gospel was probably written to Roman Christians because of the quick pace and rapid movement of the book. Um, Price can be pictured as a suffering servant, uh, also corresponding to an ox. And you can go back and look at um, um, in the Old Testament for the imagery and so forth. Um, the Gospel of Mark has been dated anywhere from AD 40s to 70s, with the late 60s holding a slight majority. Oh, and if you need a Bible, this young man will bring one to you. Uh, chapters 11 through 15 cover the last week of Mark's earthly ministry, starting with the triumphal entry and ending with his crucifixion. Okay? Um, some of the uh, social groups that are pretty important in Mark. Uh, you have your scribes, your Sadducees, your Pharisees, your chief priests, your Herodians. A um, little bit about each of those groups. The scribes, uh, by New Testament times, the scribes belonged to the sect of the Pharisees. Uh, they were considered experts in the law. Um, we'll, we'll, see about, uh, we'll see a scribe in today's passage. Uh, the Sadducees, they appear to be represented by the chief priest in, in some passages. Uh, they were willing to use more aggressive measures against Christ. So they're the ones that really came down in the last week, you know, that last week in, in the last uh, part of his earthly ministry. Um, they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the afterlife, angels, and they did not value oral traditions like the Pharisees did. Uh, the Pharisees, on the other hand, developed the tradition of strict interpretation of the Mosaic law. Uh, developing an extensive set of oral extensions of the law designed to maintain religious identity and purity. They were legalists. Uh, chief priests, a little fuzzy on that. It's, it's hard to find good information on who they are. A lot of differing opinions, but likely come from the ranks of the Sadducees, and we see them mentioned. The Herodians, uh, they're, gonna, they're mentioned in the book of Mark. Uh, a Jewish political party that sympathized with the rulers of the Herodian dynasty and therefore Rome. So these guys weren't even a religious sect. They were like a political party, okay? Um, they are depicted as allied with the Pharisees against Jesus in spite of the party's conflicting sympathies. So, you know, the, the, the Pharisees would have been totally anti-Rome, you know, but they were willing to get together and to seek to uh, undermine Jesus um, with these strange bedfellows, the Herodians. You also see them working with the Sadducees and so forth. And then all of these groups hated Jesus and wanted to get rid of him. In Mark 8.31, it, it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Mark 3.6, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. But there were exceptions. There were some people that didn't. So uh, our text for today, again, Mark 12, 28 to 34. And uh, I'm going to concentrate on loving God with your mind. Okay? And I, I picked this for myself. I, you know, if you kind of organize the conference, you get to pick what you get to talk about. You get to actually speak first and, and you know, do all that. And that was cool. Um, but I picked the mind. And um, some of you may have been here when I taught on a Wednesday of few months ago and um, I'm at that point in my life where people are dying around me you know I, I just lost a cousin who's my age um, he had a kidney transplant and it, it, I guess afterwards he was doing fine and then he started having heart issues and so suddenly he died 
uh, my sister-in-law passed away a few months ago. Um, she had a brain tumor. Um, and she's only three years older than me. And then, um, you know, my granddaughter passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but it's, it's interesting, all the people that I looked up to as idols and so forth, they, they're all dying. <laughs> they're, all, they're all, you know, all the people that I respect and so forth. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, be, being a Christian. And um, when I was back home a few months, a few weeks, yeah, I guess it's months ago now, uh, I was talking to one of my brothers, and I shared this on that Wednesday night. So just if you were here, you heard the story. And we were talking about this point in time where each of us had approached my father, who was serving in, in a church, in the denominational church. And, uh, you know, basically we asked him, like, you know, well, why do you believe this stuff? You know, why do you believe it? it, it you know, tell me why I should continue going to church with you. I just want to know why I should believe it. And my dad basically told both of us the same thing. You know, I'm your dad. I wouldn't lie to you. So it's true, right? And so that's not real good. That's not real good. Um, so later on, after I back, you know, came to be a Christian, not because of that, backslid and the whole bit, you start to kind of look into things, or hopefully you do, OK? And as you start loving God, you know, he ta um, Mark points out four different categories of loving God. You're, you know, your, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. One of the things that um, I was fortunate enough to run into and encounter were some decent apologists. Now, I'm not a, an apologist, but I glean enough to kind of know, like, okay, there are answers out there and stuff. But I think in the church, what we ignore a lot is the mind. You know, I, I grew up with a bunch of people like my dad. You know, I, I don't know. Dad's gone. He's, he's in heaven. But I, I venture to say that if there was proof that Jesus wasn't real and he was in that tomb, that they would still have faith in him, okay? That's not rational, okay? We have a rational faith. And, and Jesus, there's something really interesting about what happens in this verse when Jesus um, does this. So let's kind of, uh, let's get back to this. So hopefully you're in uh, Mark 12:28. And it says, uh, then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And let's see, I have until 1030. Good. And so the scribe came. And we saw the scribe as basically a lawyer. You know, they're probably Pharisees. They're a member of that religious group. And, and he heard them reasoning together. Okay, so something caught his ear. So there's something about this guy that I already like because he heard something and he thought, okay, this is interesting. As a Christian, you have to be intellectually honest. You have to have integrity in your mind or else you will go for anything. And then you, there are people that start, instead of staying under in the pressure of trials, they find ways to get out of them. They weasel out of them because they're not willing to accept what God has for them. And they find excuses. We don't want to be those kinds of people. We want to be somebody who's intellectually honest, who's willing to receive what God has for us and to deal with it, to trust him, to have faith. And so this guy, I, I, I think, you know, we're going to see that Jesus says a good thing about him at the end. Um, but he was perceiving, okay? So he's thinking. He's evaluating. He's perceiving. You know, the words oida. Um, Mount says it means, I know, I understand. So he thought about it, and he perceived that Jesus had answered them well. Well, who did he answer? Well, the whole book of Mark before that, he's, he's just fighting and disputing with everybody, the Herodians, the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees. And he just got through, you know, teaching the, basically handing the, the Sadducees their lunch because of the... Uh, Thing about marrying and, and you know, my if a man dies and the Leverite law and all that, and so he, he, he I think he got a kick out of that too because him being a scribe, he probably wasn't very fond of the Sadducees, so he I think he kind of likes Jesus, and so um, Jesus he asked him what's the first commandment of all, 
okay? And Jesus is going to do an interesting thing with this. But he says the first. So it's, it's basically like, what's the foremost, the first, the words protos or protos, what's the most important commandment? Now, I think this guy's kind of sincere. So let's, let's kind of follow through. And it says Jesus answered him. So notice Jesus didn't like say, well, what are you talking about? He didn't put him off. He didn't, you know, say, hey, you know, try to engage him in a weird way like he had been with those other guys because the other guys were coming at him. He knew they were testing him. But it seems like Jesus sensed that this guy was sincere. And, and that's a big deal. You have to come to God sincerely, okay? You have to ask. You can ask questions as long as you're sincere. But if you come with him and you're trying to, you know, get the answer you want to hear, somebody will give it to you. It may not be God. <laughs> it may be the guy on TV, on TVN or something, but it may not be God. And hopefully it wouldn't be me or any of the other pastors here um, because we're going to tell you what God says. So Jesus answered him. He says, first of all, the first of all the commandments, okay, the primary, the, 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 the foundational one, you know, he, he goes on and he starts quoting the Shema, you know, which is in Deuteronomy. He says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, you know, he, he starts off. And what's interesting about the Shema is that basically that word means here. And so he starts off with here. And it's kind of related when you look at the Greek translation, that word here, here is basically the same word that the Pharisees, the scribe had, you know, it described what he was doing. He was listening. And so we're to listen. You know, we're to um, be sincere, and we're to be thoughtful, and we're to be thinking, okay? Um, the word there is a cool, and again, it's the same word that, you know, the scribe used, it, it, that he heard. And it's important, you know, there's only one God. And you got to remember, in that culture back then, God had brought them out of a bunch of paganistic cultures where they were probably the only monotheists. Yeah, they were the only monotheists in history at that point, you know? And so there's a lot of pressure for them, you know, to, to continue on this route, to not want to be like the other cultures. And we see how they fell to that a lot. They kept making bad decisions because they wanted to be like everybody else. They want to give us a king just like everybody else, okay? And so um, we see that that, that was their, 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 their unction was to do that. And so he starts off with the first commandment. And then he says, and, so he puts two verses from Deuteronomy together. And, and this is where we're going to be at mostly. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, he says all. All your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. And with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So that's... This is the foremost commandment. So he's basically saying, if you believe the first thing I told you, that there's only one God, and you believe that he created everything out of nothing, and that he saved you, speaking to us, by grace, and, and notice he says, the Lord, your God. If he's your God, if you have a relationship with him. You know, a good way to look at this is to love the Lord, the one Lord, and the only God with the totality of your being. And that's the way most people take this. They say, don't bother to look at the individual capacities that are described here, the soul, mind, heart, strength. It just means your totality of your being. And that's true. But there's a lot in here, if you dig. Uh, so it behooves us to examine what that means. You know, what is he trying to tell him? And what was he trying to tell him back in Deuteronomy? Hang on, I skipped. So let's look at those terms just for a minute. The heart is, in Hebrew idiom, the center for man's thinking. Okay, So keep that in mind, because we're going to look at Deuteronomy uh, 6. And he only lists three capacities. Okay, He doesn't list four, like Mark does. He lists heart. So it's, it's the, the center of a man's thinking. Um, in Greek, the word is cardia, or cardia, and it's the center and seat of spiritual life. Uh, Vine says that it's the seat of also physical life, 
and the seat of moral nature and spiritual life, the seat of grief, joy, the desires, the affections. So it seems to lean more to the spiritual, the moral, and the emotional, okay? So that's heart. Mind. The word translated mind means understanding or intelligent. See, this word isn't in the Shema, mind, at least not in the way it's translated. Um, there's one word in Hebrew that kind of, it kind of describes both mind and heart, and we'll look at that in more detail. So it means the understanding or intelligent. It is intelligence. It's often used interchangeably with heart, but does not incur, occur in the Septuagint version of 6, 5 in Deuteronomy. The soul. Okay, so soul is a little different. I have my own take on the soul. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'll be honest, I believe in the multi, um, in, in multifaceted makeup of man. You know, I believe in body, soul, slash spirit, and different capacities and faculties within the soul. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's just the way I look at things. It's, I'm not that smart, so it enables me to look at things more effectively in the way I think, okay? But it's interesting, you know, the soul is thought of as the fount of man's will and feelings, you know, so I got a little guy there. Um, basically, in the Old Testament, it would mean the entire person. And in the New Testament, it basically speaks about the immaterial nature of, of a man, okay? So it's like the part of you that you can't see, but that comes through in your actions and your deeds. Um, it's the part of you that continues to exist when your physical body dies. It is where the faculties or capacities for such things as sight, hearing, and so forth, and I would say even spirit, uh, reside. And you don't have to agree with me, but like Vernon McGee used to say, if you want to be right, you know. <laughs> Strength emphasizes the physical power and being of a person. Uh, strength, resources, which include physical strength, but also economic or social strength. And it may extend to the physical things an Israelite owned, tools, livestock, house, and the like. I think this is not just physical strength, but also the influence that you wield. It's everything you have, everything that you, material that you own and possess, it, all the stewardships that God has given you. You know, if, you have, if you're smart, then you have to dedicate that to God. If you're good at making money, dedicate it to God and write us a big check. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't say that. Uh, it's the authority that you wield in, within your sphere. You know, that's your strength. You can affect people. You can affect culture. Question. Excuse me. Why does Jesus include the mind? Moses didn't even mention it in the Shema or the Shema. Isn't it basically the same thing as the heart? So we'll look at that. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And this is from the New King James Version. Um, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So he doesn't say mind there. Okay? Just heart. Oops, sorry. I was trying to get fancy there. Just heart, soul, and strength. Okay, so keep that in mind. The way it's translated in the New King James and the King James and most English translations um, don't show that. But wait, why did Jesus add the word mind? And why did the scribe, the lawyer, you know, the expert in the law, not call him on it? Well, according to Henry E. Turlington, I looked him up, he's a smart guy, take my word for it. Uh, in Mark 12, the word translated mind means understanding or intelligence. It is often used interchangeably with heart, but heart, again, as we said, does not occur in the Septuagint version of 6.5 in Deuteronomy. So you, know, you have this word mind that Jesus introduces, it's dianoia, um, it's the mind, it's a faculty of understanding, feeling, desiring, understanding, uh, mind, in effect, spirit, way of thinking, so forth. But it, it's something about thinking, about making rational thought and evaluating. It's part of who we are as being created in the image of God. You know, we can make choices. We have options. We can decide whether we're going to place our faith in Christ or not. Um, but just keep... Keep, it's interesting, right? It's, it's like it's not there. 
But if you look at the Septuagint, which I happen to have on my computer here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And this is the English translation or un-English translation of the Greek translation of the Hebrew, which again, I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't even claim to be, but I read a lot. Um, and I know a lot of smart guys, so that's, I follow them. But um, here we see that it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. He left out heart. Okay, I'm going to do my little fancy trick here again. It worked. Okay, so, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind and all thy soul and all thy strength. But mind is used here and not heart. Okay? So what do these smart guys have to say about that? Well, according to Daniel Block, he says in Deuteronomy 6, the Hebrew word lieb or heart often functions metaphorically for the seat of the emotions and will, but equally often it refers to the mind or the seat of thought, okay? So you see how that both ideas are encompassed within that one word? Um, you know, there's some overlap in that Hebrew word normally translated heart, you know, the seat of emotions, but it's also the seat of your thoughts, okay? So that would have been understood. In Deuteronomy 6, here the word serves comprehensively for one's inner being, including the heart and the mind, which explains, again, this is block, why in, Mark, in Mark's citation of Jesus' quotation of this verse, he uses four Greek words for Deuteronomy 3. So I got a little chart there, made this myself. No, actually, it's Dr. Block's. I just massaged it a little bit. So you see in Mark 12, where it's rendered as heart and mind, two different words for the same word lieb in Deuteronomy 6.5, whereas there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between suke and ixus and um, nefesh and mayad. Um, it's, 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 um, you know, for that one Greek word, Mark uses two Greek words to convey the full idea, okay? Because it's, it's a full idea of both emotions and will together with thought and understanding. Okay, so you can't have one without the other. So for those of you guys who are like really emotional, I know there's a few of you out there, okay? Because I, I was a mama's boy. Okay, mom's gone to heaven. But we can be very emotional, okay? But then on the other hand, most of you guys are really hard, you know what? Okay, you're just like okay. When you're relating to God, you have to be able to just, again, receive what he communicates to you. Not twist it to who you are, although you can apply it. That's the whole point of when we do inductive Bible studies. You observe the text, you interpret, and you apply it. And when you apply it, you apply it to your, your life and so forth. But you don't change it, okay? You don't make it fit who you are in per se. You fit what it says, okay? So um, interesting little thing there. And so we go back, and, and, and we'll read that again in Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay, wait, I got a little trick here. Did it work? No, it didn't work. With all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay, so you see how, it's, it, 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 how that works now? Heart and mind are both there. They're translating the same Greek word or Hebrew word, but they're used to convey the total thought that was encompassed in the original, okay? So you need to love God with all of our will and our emotions, with all of our inner being, all of our thoughts and understanding, as well as all of our outer being, okay? Okay, so there's your heart, there's your soul, there's your mind, there's your strength. Ah, it worked. You can tell I'm a tech giant, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm probably the best tech guy here outside of Dennis, so that's kind of scary. Uh, anyway, and the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
there is no commandment greater than these. You know, it's only after we love God with all that we are. You know, you have to, and you've heard, if you've been in Calvary Chapel at all for a while, you know about the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship. So you have to have that vertical relationship intact. It has to be in a proper relationship with God before you can even begin to have proper relationships on the horizontal plane with people. You know, most of us have probably felt the temptation to go back and apologize for all the things we did <laughs> when we weren't in fellowship with God in the correct way, when we, our vertical was out of whack. And even as Christians, you know, in the beginning, we probably held a lot of weird, wacko views, you know, and accepted things that were far more liberal than we would today. At least I have. And some people who went to Azusa Pacific, we're not even going to talk about them, but <laughs> um, anyway. Um, but it's only after you love God, okay, with everything in you, with everything you have, that you can actually relate to other people better, that you can love them the way that God intended you to love them. Because that's basically what it's all about. The Ten Commandments were all about having right relationships with God and man. That's it. That's the whole point when Jesus sums it all up. You know, this is it. It sums up everything. Even the 613 that, you know, you guys made up and so forth. It's, 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 it comes down to, it's pretty simple. The problem is, how do you integrate all of these areas in your life? You know, because I think most of us are linear thinkers. Even me, even the mama's boy. I'm kind of a linear thinker. So I'm, I'm concentrating today, I got to get this done. You know, and my wife's telling me, you got to get that. No, I can't get that done. I can't get that done because I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm linear, whereas she's, like, all over the place, you know, doing all kinds of stuff and worrying about asking for forgiveness instead of permission. But, um, but it, it, it's just something we have to deal with. So the scribe said to him, and, and this he's kind of not so humble. He said, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. You agree with me. <laughs> For there is one God, and there is no other but he. Okay? That's kind of, eh. This is cool, though. This is cool. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding. See, he switches now. He changed from, from mind to understanding. You know, different Greek word. From di dianoa to, I forget what the other word is, uh, synosis or something like that. I got it here in my notes somewhere. Sunesis, okay? So, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, but that's interesting. Understanding, okay? Understanding, it, mean, it takes work to understand stuff, you know? And we don't like that. It's, I want to be spoon-fed most of the time. I want to come to church and hear John tell me what I'm supposed to think. Just like my wife, if, if, if she wants to know my opinion, she'll give it to me, right? <laughs> But, I, 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 but we're like that. And the thing is that as men, we don't want to do that. We've got too much other stuff to do, you know? But there's such a treasure trove of intellectual gems within the scripture. You know, I've used this a bunch of times, but it, I, I was told back at Biola that um, the, the, um, the Bible is like a pool. It's, it's deep on one end, shallow on the other. It's, it's, it's shallow enough for a baby to wade, but it's also deep enough to drown a theologian. And you've probably all heard that, okay? But if you go through that spectrum, you know, because we all start here. Some of us jump over here, we get frustrated, and we just jump out of the pool. But, you know, but it, it's such a, a challenging journey to understand. With all the soul, verse 33 again, with all the strength, and to w love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all of the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So what's interesting about the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices? What would happen to the animal that was sacrificed in a burnt offering? It's pretty simple. They get burned, right? Nothing was left except the ashes. So instead of physically bringing an animal 
and sacrificing it. This kind of reminds me of Romans 12, your living sacrifice. You know, because we're mentally, spiritually, our soul, our heart, our strength, our mind, we're sacrificing all of that as living sacrifices. And there's nothing left. There shouldn't be. Another interesting thing. Verse 34. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, okay? See, Jesus realized, hey, this guy, he took it a step further. He likes that. Not only do you understand, hey, this is a mental thing, but it's also um, uh, using that mental apparatus to apply it to my life, to apply it how I view. It's worldview is what it is. And believe me, worldview is very important, and it's going to get more and more important you know, as the days go on. You've got to have a biblical worldview. You've got to. You've got, you, you just have to. You cannot survive as a Christian in this culture, not even in Texas anymore, because everybody thinks they're a Christian. They were all born Christians somehow. But we know better, okay? You've got to have a biblical worldview. And that takes work. It really does. It, not just intellectual, but it takes time, and, and it, takes, it takes a lot of yielding, a lot of pain, a lot of giving up old ideas and so forth. But he said to him, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So they said, oh my God, we can't get this guy. They just gave up. They're not going to question him anymore. He had an answer for everything. But not only that, he wasn't fighting with this guy. It's just that what he said was so profound. You know? And, 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 and I think, you know, it was appreciated. So Jesus commends the scribe, understanding, you know, that the scribe understood the need to mentally process what God says to us. So you, you, you have to work with those things. It, it's it's kind of weird. Um, as, as a pastor, I don't do a lot of counseling, but when I've done some, it, it, it's, it strikes me that some people, they, they, they wait until you say something that agrees with their thinking. <laughs> And then they, they're, they're all right on with it. Instead of, they walk out, it's almost like they didn't hear a word you said, okay? Because they already have a preconceived idea. And, and they're like ecstatic because now Pastor Robert agreed with me, even though I didn't. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's like that. I, I, I have people, you know, if you have people in your family, you know, just you run into these people all the time. But Jesus commended this guy. Now, John D. Berry, again, another smart guy. While the Hebrew text of Deuteronomy 6.5 includes three aspects of loving God, Jesus lists four, including a reference to the mind. In ancient Hebrew thought, the heart was the seat of human intelligence and will. When the scribe, the teacher of the law, restates the command, he refers to understanding rather than soul and mind in Mark. Jesus then recognizes that the scribe has answered wisely or with understanding. I, I thought that was ironic, kind of cool. This cluster of words related to the mind and understanding reflects a larger theme of Jesus' ministry in Mark. The true character of Jesus in the kingdom is veiled and requires true understanding. You know, that's why he did the parables, right? So some people, they're just not going to get it. If, if you approach God sincerely, and I, I believe this sincerely, anybody who approaches God sincerely will become a Christian. If you're intellectually honest and you're sincere and you really want to know the truth, he rewards that. He, he'll open your eyes. He'll take what you have and he'll give you more. And if you don't have any of that sincerity, then he'll take what you have of that and you're on the shelf. That's my take, at least. That's how I understand that. So we look at a couple of verses here for mind, just to understand why mind. And in both words, I'll use both words, uh, dianoia and uh, the other one. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. This is 1 Peter 1, 3, 13 through 16. Gird up the loins of your mind. That's fantastic. I remember the first person I ever heard teach on this was Xavier Reese. And he said something that I'm going to quote um, in a minute. 
but I'm not going to give him credit for it. Um, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. See, there's something, girding up the loins of your mind, it's like a soldier, you know, girding up his, the, 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 the tunic and getting ready to go out and fight. You know, and so he's saying, do that with your mind. Prepare your mind. We all have capacities and faculties that we are blessed with. Some of us, not so much, but others of you, yeah. But use what you got. There's no excuse to not use what you have. He goes on, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. See, Peter was talking to who? You know, he's talking to Christians who are being persecuted from the outside. Now, Second Peter is about false teachers and kind of an internal thing. But First Peter, he's talking about, you know, being a witness and, and expecting these trials. He's saying they're not weird, they're not strange. You know, you're going to go through them because you're a Christian. Okay? And so he, he talks about that. But as we go through these things, in order for us to stand up to what happens, to take the pressure, you've got to gird up your, the loins of your mind. You have to be, a lot of that is just taking God at his word and drawing a line in the sand. That's it. But be open for God to move your line, as long as he's the one moving it. Gird up, and I don't know how to say that word, which is a metaphor referring to the ancient oriental custom of tying up one's loose flowing robes in the process of getting ready for hard work. An equivalent contemporary metaphor would be, let's roll up our sleeves and get right to work on the business of holiness. And that's uh, Ed Hinson. This is MacArthur. The ancient practice of gathering up one's robes when needing to move in a hurry. Here it is metaphorically applied to one's thought process. The meaning is to pull in all the loose ends of one's thinking by rejecting the hindrances of the world and focusing on the future grace of God. So that's in that context on that particular passage. Uh, another place where he uses the other word, uh, synesis or synesis. Colossians 1.9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God okay so this is Paul and he's talking about being filled with the knowledge okay and understanding he says filled with the knowledge of his will you know I, I don't know, God doesn't usually like pop things into my head a lot of times, unless I've read them, okay? Um, a lot of it comes in dealing with um, Him in the Bible, through prayer, through, you know, spending time with Him, and then kind of working things out. And then having the courage to either agree with Him, because if you don't agree with Him, you don't change he's just going to come back and do the same thing over and over and over and over and you're going to be sad and depressed and like me um, until you learn your your lesson but um, he's saying that as they walk in the works that God has laid before them in a way that is pleasing to God which is spirit led that they would be fruitful and grow in their knowledge of him so as we attempt to have understanding we grow in our knowledge and our understanding okay but it doesn't just happen it's, it's, not os, it's, it's not osmosis. You, know, you don't just grab your Bible and sleep on it and, you know, you learn. You've got to spend time. But, you know, Acts, Acts 2, you know, that's great. The Apostles' Doctrine, fellowship, worship, you know, all that, breaking of bread. That's, that's all, it's, 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 it's totally necessary for you to grow as a Christian. And it's hard because a lot of times we don't like each other, if we're honest, right? You know, sometimes we don't. We rub shoulders, you know, and we're like the, I forget who it was, the spiritual porcupines. You know, we don't want to hug each other because of the 
the little stingy things. But as you're hugging that spiritual porcupine, he's getting ministered, but so are you, because you're learning how to deal with the, the, the quivers, or whatever they're called. What was it a head, a head? Who was that, Zach? That book? No, it was, it was in the book. John, what book was that? The survey, yeah, Warren's Wiersbe. Yeah, it's a great illustration. So, um, you know, it's painful sometimes. It hurts. It gets, you get stung. But as you're ministering to other people, as you're doing these things, then you're going to get ministered too. So there's something in it for you. Which brings me to uh, 1 Peter 3.15. So remember, 1 Peter, persecution. They were living in a hostile environment that didn't appreciate them. They were called sojourners, pilgrims, right? This wasn't their home. And so he tells them to guard up the loins of your mind and get busy and so forth. And then a little further down it says, after Peter exhorts them to not to expect being um, suffering as a Christian, he says, you don't want to suffer as a murderer because you deserve that, right? But you suffer as a Christian for doing what's right. And there's all kinds of interesting ways that he puts it in, in first peter he says if this happens but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense you know an apology a, 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 an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear so the thought is that by the way you live and you're living according to how you think for as a man thinks so he is right you, 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 you're going to be living in this hostile environment, and people are going to ask you, you know, why are you like that? How can, how can you, how come you're not like falling apart, or how come you're not cussing back at these people? Although sometimes we probably do, we shouldn't. But you see what I'm saying? You have to gird up the loins of your mind. You have to think. You have to. Your mind is important. You know, you have to develop that, you know, in all kinds of ways. Even if it's just like um, reading the Bible is, is awesome, you know, because you really learn a bigger vocabulary. You learn to write better and read better and so forth. But, um, you know, just keep this in mind, because this reminds me of my dad. He couldn't give me an answer. He couldn't give me an answer. You know, my kids are not walking with the Lord, but I sure as heck made sure I could give them an answer. So now it's on them. You know, um, sanctify the Lord. Set them apart in your hearts. Okay, that's the word hearts. But be ready to give a defense. Because people are going to ask. You know, especially if you're thinking Christianly. You know, think biblically. Think biblically. Worldview. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for this time. We just look forward to what you're going to do the rest of the day, Lord. I pray for Pastor James as he gets ready to come up in a few minutes, Lord. I just pray that anyone else who's coming, Lord, you'd bring safely, Lord, and that you would um, just have your hand on this day and upon us and all the men that are here, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity. We pray that you would continue to keep your hand on the sound, on the technical aspects, Lord. And uh, again, Lord, just thank you for saving us, Lord. And for anyone who's here who may not know you, Lord, I pray that they would um, find time to do business with you, Lord, that they would um, grab somebody in a shirt and maybe ask some questions and maybe pray and give their life to Christ if that's what they're supposed to do today. We just thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.